It's sunny here. It's springtime. Only pretty ring time. <laughs> Do you know that song? I was, I have no Spring. idea what you're talking about, but okay. It's springtime. Only pretty ring time. Somebody will know. I don't know. I don't know where that comes from. I bet our producer <laughs> is going to put some, lay some music in right now. It's and I'm happening. Like, oh, yeah. In springtime, the only pretty ring time birds sing. Hey, ding. A ding, a ding, sweet lovers love the spring. If it's springtime, then you put a ring on it. I don't know. Now that's a thing. That's going to bother me now for the whole episode. <laughs> you could Google it. I'm, gonna, I'm Googling lyrics it right come now. right up. Um, later today, Little Romance will be playing his first beach volleyball of the season because it's supposed to be wow. 65 here. And wow, his beach volleyball coach is real committed to, like, getting the kids out on the sand. And they were not out on the sand all last year because of COVID. They had to play on the grass. So, Well, I'm very happy for him that he's playing beach volleyball in Chicago, which feels cognitively dissonant for fun. Okay. Everybody, right now, when you look down on your app, I'm going to put a picture, my favorite picture of Little Romance. You can't see his face. It's from a couple years ago. He was playing on the beach at Oak Street. And it's like this very classic Chicago scene because the Drake Hotel, it's like the beach and then like the city. And it's amazing. Oh, um, it's Shakespeare. See, I'm classy. I don't even know how classy I am. <laughs> It's a song from <laughs> As You Like It. It's one oh. of the songs they sing in As You Like It, which, fun fact, I student directed when I was in high school. Well, look at you. Because that's how cool I am. <laughs> You're looking at the president of the drama club two years running. Well, I mean, Sarah. That's where I peaked. I peaked hard junior year of high school. <laughs> Didn't we all? No. <laughs> we did not, actually. We're living our best lives. I did not peak junior year of high school. I was the biggest dork who ever dorked in high school. But I had, I was talking to Eric about this the other day because, of course, when you, as you know, when you have a child, you're like, oh, God, I just hope she finds her people. Like, yeah. even if she's a weirdo, <laughs> like, as long <laughs> as she finds her fellow weirdos, sure. like, she'll be okay. And I think that was the gift that high school gave me was, like, mm -hmm. I was reading romance novels all the time, and I had my, like, best friend who was also reading romance novels all the time, and I w found my drama geeks, and we, like, lived our best drama club lives. Yeah. Like, hanging out and being weird. It's that scene with, uh, from, what's that witch movie? The Craft. Oh, yeah. Rose Craft, where she's like, we are the weirdos, Mr. Yes. Like, yes. Okay. That was it. <laughs> as long as you find your own weirdos, you'll yes. be fine. And I feel like that's a good lesson for the whole of your life. Like, just find your own weirdos. I agree. I've been lucky. Kelly and I have been best friends for a long time. And, and now we still look. are. And now look at us. <laughs> we're our own weirdos, but we're 47. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I also, I feel bad for people who, like, you know, there are still those people who you must know and follow on Instagram. Or, well, you don't care about Instagram, but you you must know from, like, your real life, from IRL, <laughs> where, um, you know, like, there are these, there are, there are a number of people from my real life who I follow on Instagram or who I, like, see periodically when I'm, you know, home at my mom's house. And I think to myself, like, ah, oh, you're still trying to be the cool kid. And, like, I'm too old for that. <laughs> I know. So don't try to be the cool kid. Just be the weirdo. And the cool thing about being the weirdo is that then you are the cool kid to your fellow weirdo. <laughs> it all works out really. I know. Just love it's yourself. so nice. And then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> it's a little inspirational. Yeah, here I am. This is advice time with Sarah. There's all this like Gen X versus millennial bullshit on TikTok. Yeah. Wait, is that right? Or millennials versus Gen Z on TikTok? I don't even Who knows? know. Some fight on TikTok about jeans and hairdo. And and honestly, like, everybody calm the hell down. <laughs> Wear the jeans you want to be in the world. Exactly. I'm only specifically worried about this because I will say, now that we're all about to re-enter society, I do find my... I, I don't know how to talk to people anymore. Like, I phone call with a friend I haven't talked to in a long time this week. And I just was like, oh, my God, I've been talking about myself the entire time. Like, yeah. I just feel like my ability to modulate and 
so I am a little worried about that. So, you know, be the weirdo, but also give the other weirdos a chance to talk, I guess. That's my... <laughs> That's the gen corollary to the McLean rule. Don't take up all the air in the room like me. I'm always like, I've got so much to say now that we're back together. <laughs> fine i missed everybody i know we're all but i did read there was a great piece in the times or somewhere some piece some place wrote a piece they interviewed a psychologist who was like look it's gonna be real weird for everyone for a while yeah. like people are gonna yeah. give give people a chance like give people some some space if they're having trouble meeting your eyes or like being weird and awkward in conversation, just kind of try and take a breath and not so, be so quick to judge as we might have been two years ago. And I think that that's really valuable. But also, Jen and I love you. And if you you come to us and you're weird or we come to you and we're weird, just, you know. We, we found each other. We are the weirdos, mister. <laughs> <laughs> so it's two ladies with a romance podcast. So, you know, fine. I mean, Kind of accurate. <laughs> I mean, I'm not even saying Somebody send me crystals in the mail. Yeah, they, d- nobody, I do not get mysterious things in the mail unless I order them. guys, over the I last, like, two months, I've gotten real, some real weird, nameless gifts in the mail. I got flowers once. I'm a Midwesterner, so, like, the crystals did not come from me. That's a little woo for me. You know? It was real woo-woo. I mean, look, I'm for it. If you send me crystals, thank you. But I literally got a box in the mail and it was filled with sage sticks and crystals and a and a booklet on how to manifest success. And I was like, well, I'm doing this. It's 2021. I'm manifesting the shit out of my success. Light it up for little romance in his financial aid packages. I was like, can you work that for me? <laughs> I don't know. I pulled a, an obsidian out of the box and I held it in my hand. So there you go. That was my gift to you. Well, I'm going to be talking about a book later today called Heart of Obsidian, so well done. Oh, look at that. On brand. Anyway, if you know about crystals and manifestation, hit me up. And I me. I got a box. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like asking for crystals to, like, manifest a financial situation does feel a little fucked up, though. I don't think that's probably the way they're supposed to be used, so. I don't know. I mean, this, the booklet is, like, about abundance. I mean, what else do I want in abundance? <laughs> I would like abundance of financial I'm like Cardi aid, so B. Yes. <laughs> I don't really need to be any oh, Sarah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's our patter for the day. <laughs> if you're still with us, <laughs> welcome everyone to Faded Mates. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Prokop. I am a romance reader and critic. I'm Sarah McLean, and I read romance novels and I write them. And this week, we are coming at you with a one-year-old request episode. So we should talk about this because every year, and it's coming up on it, there yeah. might even be a link for it this week oh, perfect. in show notes. If not, we'll make Look, sure we tweet it. I would feel a lot more guilty, but it's been a pandemic and time has no meaning. So a year of pandemic time means that we did this in like a, we were on point. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure Katie would agree. Um, okay, Katie, we love you. Um, so, okay, a year ago, <laughs> During the pandemic. Every year, Kennedy Ryan, who is um, an all-around delightful person and also a prolific writer and also a very skilled writer and also a mom and a person in the world, uh, hosts a... She hosts a um, auction to raise money for families with autism. And uh, she's been doing this for years. It's called the Lift Auction. We will make sure that we at least post the information on the organization that Kennedy works with. And um, it's amazing. And last year, she asked Fata Mates if we would be willing to donate an item to the auction. And we donated a custom episode. You pick your trope, we'll do your episode. Katie Robert was so generous. And she bid on the item. And she won the item. And she said she wanted a morale. Ta- chain episode and we interviewed Katie those of you who are regular listeners know that we interviewed Katie um, a few months I'm back sorry, yeah. on Menage Romance because Katie writes Menage very well we approve mm-hmm. thumbs up from us um, but we wanted to just say well one I wanted to apologize because I have sent Katie about six emails saying like oh it's coming like next month <laughs> 
<laughs> and then it hasn't come. So here we are. But it is officially here. Here we are. There we go. See, we do get there. This is like being my editor. <laughs> Just everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I... I hope Katie understands. You know what? We will talk to Katie if if maybe there's something else we can do for her. We can do a little. (laughs) I know, like an added bonus. You know what else, though? I think the the timing of this will work out for her because I believe the next in her, like, Taboo series might be coming out this week. Ooh, yeah. Which might be Guardian. Oh, yeah. Guardian (laughs) Ward. My favorite. I'm not sure, but I saw it go back, go pie on the timeline. I thought it was the end of the month, but... I guess that actually is the end of the month, practically. Oh, God, it really is. Um, So anyway, thank you so much, Katie, for donating to Lyft. Um, Thank you, Kennedy, for raising money for such an important cause. Um, We are so excited to be a part of it. We are a part of the next auction as well, which launches um, early April. And... um, you can have yeah. a chance. We'll do and we won't we'll take a year for yours. How about that? We'll do our goal will be to do it sooner than a year. <laughs> yeah. Six months, maybe. We'll give ourselves a little bit. I mean, room. pandemic de- dependence, but yes. Right. <laughs> so we're talking morality chain. Yeah. So let's go ahead and define what morality chain is first. Because I think we have a different, I think we have a very specific definition of morality chain that isn't the one that gets passed around. One thing I just want to say is I think Katie was really hoping that we would find some new recommendations for her. And I I will admit, I'm not sure that we are going to like come up to scratch on that. This is a really difficult thing to pull off in romance. I think we are going to give her some new books though, because we're yeah. going to talk about old books too. Yeah. yeah. And that's something a lot of people haven't gone back. Right. Right. So why don't you start? You, I did. I took notes for this episode. I'm so worried. I'm, well, it feels more important when somebody's, you know, yes, paying money for us. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is free most of the time. <laughs> I know. We care less most weeks. <laughs> it's free all the time. Okay. So traditionally, when you talk about morality chain and romance, you hear a lot of discussion of, well, it's just a bad dude. Like, the hero has right. to be a bad dude. And, I mean, sometimes that's a heroine, but most of the time we're talking about a hero. I was going to say that. This does seem very gendered, for sure. Yeah, well, that's because of a lot of other things related right. to unlikable heroines, which, you know, sucks to see many of our former episodes. So... Traditionally, that's kind of when you see the request go by on Twitter, it usually says, like, looking for morality chain romances. And then the reply is, what's a morality chain romance? And then the reply to that is, you know, something where, like, the hero's real bad. Yeah. And then you see a long list of thread, threaded tweets of recommendations of what I would refer to as dark, dark romance, romance. Right. which is going to shock some of you. I don't think these two things are the same. I don't either. And you and I kind of independently came up with, like, a very similar way of kind of... I know. We were texting each other, and I was like, faded mates! Of course. (laughs) Which is often a morality chain trope, by the way. Okay, anyway. Yeah. (laughs) Fine. All right, so you keep going. Sorry. I just wanted everybody to know what our mind meld was like. I think we need to talk about dark romance at some point, too. Um, We sort of touched on it with Nisha Sharma when we talked about mafia romance, but again... Not all, there's, this is like one of those Venn diagram situations where not all dark romances, not all mafia romances are dark dark, romance. Right. I think, and I mean, I hate to be absolute about it, but for me, I'm pretty sure dark romance and morality chain romance, while they live close to each other, are separate circles. I think so too. My, I spent some time talking to my friend Julie Block about this, who you've met on Zoom. Yes. Because she is like, I think, of as, like, my dark romance expert. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you and I talked about is, like, in morality chain, all right, let's say hero. We're just going to keep it gendered. The heroine, I guess, let's assume it's MF. Well, just for the sake of this thing. Of the definition. In morality chain, um, the hero's, uh, his only, like, link to sort of goodness is through his love interest. And she pulls him, essentially, into caring about the world or acting in a way that he wouldn't otherwise because of her need for the world to look a certain way. Yes. So he's pleasing her. 
right? Like, yeah. she wants the world to be better, and I have some sort of power over that, so I'm going to act in a way that is against what would be my normal way because of this need that she has, and I love her. Right. Whereas in dark romance, what you and I think is maybe the the opposite, almost like the inverse, is that often he's similarly troubled or bad or problematic or whatever, but she is pulled more into his world than the opposite. Yeah. So where, you know, we talked about, we've talked about the heroine's journey by Gail Carriger before on the podcast. I really want to talk about that. Yeah. And I think that it's an important way of potentially underscoring what you're getting at because so, so the heroine's journey is named that it, it's not meant to be gendered. Um, despite the title, it's meant to be a foil to the Joseph Campbell hero's journey concept, which is essentially a Campbell a million years ago said, um, you know, the greatest writing in the world is all hero's journey, which means like man goes on a journey, man, capital yep. M human goes on a journey, mm-hmm. um, leaves the safe, the safe bosom of his slash her slash their community and then moves moves forward on a quest or a path where they must go it alone in order to like come to their own success or triumph. And there's usually there's sometimes a sidekick or there's people there are people along the way who they meet but then they meet them and then they sort of lose them. That the those people then fall by the wayside and ultimately at the end the hero, quote, is standing alone at the yeah. end in triumph by himself, um, by themselves. So, which is an archetype. It's a way. Well, it is. And you know what? You got, it's a very common way. Like, it's, it's, this is. It's a real superhero-y way. Yes. It's James Bond, right? Like, there are people who help you, but then they probably die. It's Batman. It's, I mean, it, once mm-hmm. you know that blueprint, it's ever, it's Indiana Jones. I mean, it's everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. One of the things I guess I would say that I was thinking about as I, because I've been reading The Heroine's Journey this week, and I was thinking about, like, the end, right? So something Gail Carriger says in the book is that at the end of this, right, he's either grown too powerful to fit back into the world he has saved, or he has changed too much into a solo version of himself and can no longer exist in a group. And so it essentially ends, the heroic narrative ends with almost like a hermit's existence. And the thing I was thinking of is maybe morality chain is essentially like a corrective, like we're we're starting with the hero in that point and thinking like what would it take to like bring him back from the brink of what that journey has done to him? Right. To, so the arc of the heroine's journey is about finding community, yes. right? Like a heroine might start the story alone, but very quickly begins to create and build a community. And then her triumph is, or their triumph is at the end, finding community as right. part of the resolution of the story. Right. So at the beginning of the heroine's journey, the heroine is on their own. And then, well, I mean, not always, but many times. Right. And then the at the end, with people and the hero's journey, they are alone through the whole thing. If there are other people, they, they are ephemeral. They come in and out. Right. Well, and it, it's like the key then of the hero's journey is like triumph, but the key to the heroine's journey is like negotiation, mm-hmm. right? Like, it's not like we're going to necessarily vanquish it, but like through our powers of working together, Right? right? It's like the found family trope that you and I both love so much is like another way of saying this heroine's journey. And so I think that morality chain, while it's a new word, it's kind of a buzzy trope these days in romance. You, uh, I feel like we didn't hear the words morality chain five years oh, yeah. ago. Right. It's a newer kind of concept. And I wonder actually where, did you look it up? I did. So it was list. It it gets named. Is it like a fic thing? It may be. I mean, it gets listed as, like, on, like, now as, like, a trope. I mean, I think once, like, 
TVTropes.com and Wiki- Wikipedia Tropes or, or you know, Fandom.com. There's all this, like, urge to sort of name things. But I bet it does come from Thic because then you can essentially, like, you know, in AO3, tag it that way. So I do think that it's um, really specifically probably linked to that. Um I think it's a great, it's so specific, though, and it's such a, I don't know, it's a great phrase. I could see why it's caught on, I guess I'd say, right? It's a lot harder to sort of grasp the difference between morality chain and, like, I'm only good for you, right, is essentially kind of what it is, but that seems somehow not to capture, I think, the depths at which our hero, right, finds himself at the beginning before he finds this love. I mean, romance does a lot with that. I mean, and I think for me, the kind of archetype of this... The, or the the blueprint for Morality Chain is Spike from Buffy. I was Sarah. Oh, Faded Mates. Also on my list, yeah. I wanted yeah. to talk about Spike and Angel, actually. I was thinking about Angel, too, and I just, I'm not sure he fits the mold, but. I don't think he does, but I think it was like a bits and pieces. I think maybe in mm-hmm. his own TV show, we get more of it. I think in Buffy, it's Spike, for sure. Yeah, and it feels to me like with Spike, part of the joy of Morality Chain, and, you know, when when we talk about tropes on the podcast, we really try hard to hit at what it exactly is about the trope that scratches the itch, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that really gets us as readers. And I think the reason why I look at Spike is because he has all of the hallmarks of the morality chain hero in that he is very evil at the beginning. Yep. Extremely clever, full of, like, quips and dry, like, Mm -hmm. you know, snide comments and dry humor. He is handsome in a sense, like, unlikely handsome. Um, And always there as a wall that Buffy has to bang against. And as readers or as viewers, for the first, like, two seasons, you're like, when is this going to happen? Right? Instantly, we're like, this is him. Like, this is a compelling character who we want to see in a romance. I also think there's a way to me in which the morality chain character has to speak into existence their fear that the other character's naivete is a danger. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, like, I think a lot about, like, Spike and Buffy and her kind of, like, you know, fighting for good and him being like, you're just, what are you doing that for? Right? And I think that is a way, it's like this balancing out of the scales. Like, where do I really stand? What's important to me? And so they also function... I don't know. Does that make sense as like Yeah, a- because it's also Grumpy One, Sunshine One. Like, yes. if you like Grumpy One, Sunshine One, you like Morality Chain, but like Lucy Goosey. Right. Because the truth is that that's the same yes. concept. Right. Because and- Grumpy One hates that Sunshine One is like naive and bright and like yeah, I could start- get hurt. I searched my own tweets because I was really curious if I'd ever talked about morality chain. And I said something about this once. And I said, like, if, you know, the risk taking of, like, I have been hurt before, and but I'm going to enter in a relationship with this person. I'm going to, like, put my trust in them. That's it. Morality chain is just that, but, like, on steroids. Yes. Right? Yes. So it's that same fear because these men are impenetrable and untouchable. The world cannot get to them. Yes. Right? Yes. I was, can, before we go on to talk about some books, though, or baby self-talk, another character, so I did a lot of research on this because I was really curious about other examples. And, you know, another example I found that was not about love, but was about friendship, and I thought it was really interesting, was, um, remember that show, How I Met Your Mother? Of course. They pointed out that Ted acts as, acts as the morality chain for Barney. That Barney is constantly like a scumbag and doing bad things, but basically every time he goes too far, it's be- or he worries that he's going to go too far and dials it back, it's because he fears his friend Ted's disapproval. And I thought that was like a really interesting point. And I kind of was like, 
I did what you're doing right now, which was like, huh, okay. Yeah, I'm like head tilting. I, I guess. Sure, and maybe not to that extent. It's interesting because I don't think of Barney as being like, I don't well, think of, not, I think in morality you know. chain, like, it, there has to be a threat of damage, right? There has to be a real, like, threat of yes. villain, villainy. Well, I think if you were a woman who came across oh, Barney. I might feel that way about Barney. I don't know. But, like, <laughs> yeah. Barney's so hard, like, weirdly, like, gr- like sure. he's such a, like, harmless. I know, I mean, I think of Barney, we've talked about this before, too, but I think Barney's a dog. Like a. Oh, yeah, you've told me this. Right? You know, like a comedy dog. But sure. whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm with you. I mean, you also see this. So there's on um, tvtropes.org, I just, like, pulled it up just to see what it says. It also refers to something called a morality pet, mm. which I think is probably more that feel where it's, yeah. like. Not quite as hardcore, yeah. The, like. Like, if they, the concept being, like, there's a child or a friend or a dog, like, an animal that the villain loves. I was thinking of that movie, The Professional, with Natalie Portman as a kid, and she befriends the assassin. Oh, Jason Statham. No, 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 that's a different one. Jason Statham has one, too, where there's a kid. Yeah, but I was thinking, it's, I can't remember his name. You know, he essentially, same thing, right? He's an assassin, but he loves this little girl. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is the whole, and I mean, like, the assassins, this is why I'm, like, I'm desperate. I'm thirsty for assassin romances. Sure. Because assassins make perfect morality chain heroes because they're, like, it's that gross point blank moment where John Cusack is like, no, 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 no. I'm not a, I'm not evil. Like I kill for money. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. And right. so, um, but I will say, so I think there are a few places in romance where you are hard. We are almost hard pressed to not find morality chain in some way. Yeah. And I think that is, I mean, we have to start with paranormal. We do. I right? Agree. And we've yeah. talked so much about paranormal on Faded Mates that we, Jen and I, kind of haven't talked about paranormal in years because yeah. we spent right. an entire season talking about paranormal. And so I just want to say, if you are new to romance, and we know you are, not romance, if you are new to Faded Mates, and we know a lot of you are, we know that, I mean, I right. we can see our numbers, we know there are many thousands of you who did not, who were not with us in the first season. Um, if you are interested in morality chain, and if you are interested in paranormal, you really should begin with yes. Cressley Cole's Immortals After Dark series. Um, because probably, I mean, I was like, I was thinking through them and I was like, that one, oh, that one. Uh, okay. That there one, are a no. lot of morality chain books, but the obvious one is Lothair. Yeah, of course. Um, so why don't we talk a little about, mor- about, uh, Morality Chain and Paranormal and what it does. Can I start by actually talking instead? Well, I kind of feel like just listen to season one. We can talk about more. Yeah, but I think we need to actually give people like some moments where they can, there's some entry points to Cressley because we're, we we do not expect you to eat, to eat. Why did I say eat? We do not expect you to read 18 books. Like, but I do think there are some of these um, books that, really are the right choices here. Okay, Lothair is definitely, I think, probably the easiest starting point. One of the ways I think it works in paranormal, and it makes sense kind of thematically when you think about it, is the question of always in a paranormal is, especially when you get supernatural creatures of any kind, is like what part of them is human versus what part of them is a werewolf or a vampire or whatever. So it makes sense kind of intuitively that paranormal would really dig into these themes because one of the the biggest fears, I mean, think about Uther, which is in Wicked Abyss. He hasn't, he's been a drag in dragon form forever, right? And no one knows if he'll ever kind of switch back. And everybody who's ever read Crestley knows that what's going to make him come back is falling in love, right? Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that in Paranormal, the connection to a human would be the one that would, like, help 
this paranormal creature Mm -hmm. find their humanity, right? And that's why I think, looking back, no one should have ever been surprised that Lothair's fated mate was going to be a human. Because he was the the only way they have to see humanity in order they have to understand humanity i would also say that and this is the book i recommend to anybody who's like where do i start like if i want to if i'm not sure i want to do 18 books and i don't want to start with a hunger to like no other because it does a lot of like that old school romance stuff Mm -hmm. where do i start my answer is always dark needs at night at night's edge because though the heroine is a ghost she is human yeah. Like the hero is a vampire who has drunk so many people to death that he has gone crazy. He's gone insane. And so, and in order for him to come back literally from the brinks of insanity, he needs a human to remind him that there is purpose. Yeah. So I think that's a good one. I think, I think Rune is very disconnected from your boy. Rune. <laughs> right? Very disconnected from his humanity. But also, this is clearly, this is a core story for Cressley because yes. in the Game Maker series, right, there is the, in the professional, he's like a bodyguard slash hitman, right? Mm-hmm. And um, in the master, I mean, like the hero of the master is absolutely does not have time for feelings. And that's not just about, we've talked about this before, that like that's a mark of an alpha, but in morality chain, it's also coded with, he doesn't have time for feelings and he so doesn't have time for feelings that he lacks an ability to see the difference between right and wrong or an interest in right and wrong. Right. 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 What he is willing to do basically anything for his own advancement. Right. Um, in her Game Maker series, I think book number three, The Professional. I don't think that does it. You don't think the, so? The player. You don't think the pl- You think the player's morality chain? I mean, he literally is. I know, but he's not hurting other people. He's hurting himself. That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I, well. Because he's not I, dangerous to other people. Yeah. Does he need to be for morality chain? I think so. I think he has to be a threat to a larger community, no? Hmm. I don't know. That's an inter- that is an interesting question. I would say maybe... Because are you amoral or immoral if you're harming yourself? All right, this is actually really interesting. To me, the sexy part of morality chain is pulling someone back into their own humanity. And he is... Right? That's the... That's sexy and he is so god we're apart- so broken i know i don't people. care Fine. <laughs> i don't care it's what i want to read i have no regrets don't ever do this in real life no PSA. God, no <laughs> this is a these are professional drivers on closed courses <laughs> Yes. <laughs> right? I mean, he is completely separated from all human society. And she is the one who literally, uh, when he sees her. Maybe, yeah. I mean, maybe I get a, it. An offshoot of it. I don't know. I get what you're saying. I don't think it fits the mold, but I I understand what you're saying. I think that's, I think that book is something else. That is a truly broken hero. Like, which I guess is sort of morality chain adjacent. And this is the we're back to Venn diagrams. Somebody sure. out there is building is building we're the biggest Venn diagram there is. Well, I yeah. Anyway, I don't know. Like that's it is. It's really interesting. So Nalini Singh also in her side changelings has quite a few, but the one that is the most kind of famous, and I think also pure morality chain. I mean, if you really are like, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, this is a little too fuzzy for me, then you should read Heart of Obsidian. Because I do think, I don't think there's any kind of like, "Mm, I'm not sure, or like, maybe it would work. This book is straight morality chain. So if you want like a blueprint for it, I think that this book would be it. And what it is, is uh, Caleb is a sigh, which if you I've only actually, okay, by the way, somebody once told me I couldn't read this book if I hadn't read the previous, like, nine or whatever. I did. I read it cold, everybody. It's fine. Nalini does a great job of reestablishing the world in every book. Yes. Um, which is very useful. I mean, I've read all of them, but 
Yeah. You don't I, have to. I really did not. I mean, I've read, I think I've read the first one and then I read this one. So I skipped a lot in between. And um, he is the most powerful telekinetic on the planet. So much so that he can cause earthquakes if he wants to. And sometimes does accidentally when he's having orgasms. And I wasn't <laughs> mad about that either. <laughs> Fine. And he has been searching for seven years for um, a woman named Sahara. And he, at the beginning, he finally finds her. And he, it's not that he's been searching, like, I've been looking for her. She was kidnapped, and he knows that she has been tortured. And she knows that, you know, they are trying to essentially extract from her a special skill that no other Psy has. And the beginning is he finds her. Apparently, he's been searching her for her for a couple of books. I missed all that. I just get to him finding her. And she is a fascinating character because she describes the way she survived this torture is she created a labyrinth in her mind that's like a kaleidoscope, right? It just switches and changes. And he, there's someone attacking something called the Cyanet, which all made sense to me and it was fine. And his power is so vast that he essentially might be the only one to be able to stabilize the Cynet, but then this would make him even less in touch with his humanity because of the responsibility that this would cause. And this book is straight morality chain. Mm -hmm. She is the only connection he has to humanity. And he is so disconnected and can, like, willfully turn on and off both his feelings and everything else. Mm -hmm. Like many sides, but his is so much more powerful. And I just thought it was a fascinating book if you are interested in this trope. Because the other thing about this book that was really interesting was it's so tonally perfect, by which I mean it's very controlled. It's a very, um, even when terrifying things are happening, it's all really tight because of how he is, right? Like the mood and tone of the book really match his ability to, like, sort of keep everything um, focused. It's, like, a real masterwork. I mean, she's an amazing author, so that's Mm -hmm. no shock. But I also think it really, um, like, in its execution, also shows what the world would be like for someone who lived that way, if that makes sense. Yes. The whole series is great, and I think many of the books in that series, like, could conceivably could re- could be considered morality chain and this is why because fundamentally the conflict for many of the romances in that series are about feelings right, right. one character is able to feel feelings and feelings yeah. are verboten they're illegal yeah. right. in this society so when the two characters come together sure. you know that is like fundamentally one of the characters having to get in touch with feeling Yes. Is the whole ball game. Right. Um, and so I want to talk about, since we're doing this, I also want to underscore, we, t- we talked, we did an episode in season two about J.R. Ward and about um, the Black Dagger Brotherhood. Mm-hmm. But I want to um, talk about uh, one of the books. It's book seven of the Black Dagger Brotherhood, which is called Lover Avenged. It's Revenge's book. That's a great one. Um, and it is also one of these... Um, the one of these moments where I think it goes back to what Jen was saying about the hero, the the um, the morality chain, the character who needs to be brought forward into morality being um, being uh, having it all be about feelings, right? So the hero of this book, revenge. There's an H in there somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Lover avenged. Um, he's a sympath, which means that he feeds on abo- on emotions. Mm. Um, so, um, and basically, like they feed on, they tend to feed on negative emotions, right? Um, and they can also uh, get into your mind and sort of alter the way you um, you have mem- the the way that you see memory. Um, and so he's like kind of he runs like, but also he hates himself for it. Like he right, it's yes. He he's broken from the start because he loathes this piece of himself, and so because he loathes this piece of himself, he's really like 
closed himself off from the world. And I think this is the other thing that we really like. It's, again, it's piece of, it's an evolution of the primordial alpha concept, mm-hmm. right? Like, he's so closed off, and somebody cracks him open. And Elena um, revenges heroin is like a nurse in the vampire hospital. (laughs) And she's like kind and decent and like a good person. And he, this is one of what I, the, for me, the best moment of the morality chain episode is when, or episode, the morality, the morality chain book is when the character who is not evil or is not amoral turns up in this amoral space or this yes. evil or this bad space as light, right? Like in mm-hmm. this dark space as light and absolutely sends the hero in this case, like stratospheric, like with worry, with concern. Right. Oh yeah. Um, God, the best. because that worry and that concern doesn't, isn't ever processed thoughtfully by the hero. Like, it's not like he's like, I understand that I'm feeling worry here. <laughs> and the reason why I'm feeling worry is because I care about this, like, ray of sunshine. Ray of sunshine yes. No, he's like, I feel worry. This is awful. Burn it all down. <laughs> <laughs> Let me make an earthquake with my mind. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, Caleb. Fine. <laughs> Caleb actually, like, hit the extent of his feelings for her made a gorge outside of his house that's, like, bottomless. But he's like, I don't have feelings. I just have my gorge. <laughs> Amazing. Ugh. All right, go back to love revenge. I'm fine. Yeah, no, 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 it's fine. So I think, so it's it's really interesting. Oh, and I should say, revenge is half sympath. This is important for reasons in the book. But what? don't. If you're a J.R. Ward fan, don't at me. I know. (laughs) But the point is that the arc of this story is, so he's so, and so he's so closed off and for every, and also the other piece of this is like the instant feeling of ownership and like possession that these heroes often feel for the heroine, right? Like it's that moment in A Hunger Like No Other where Lachlan destroys an entire hotel room, but like leaves Emma in her like cocoon of perfectly safe, yeah. Perfectly safe space because he is so enraged, but like he couldn't possibly harm her, right? right. And we see this sort of hyper protection in morality chain that I think really strikes at the core of like what so many of us love about these like big yeah. bananas books. Mm-hmm. And I think that really goes back to, um, that goes back to like the old school like pirate romances. I've yeah. you know when I was thinking preparing for this, I was for me all of the big morality chain books that I could think of were like truly old school. Like I wanted to talk about um, there's this there's a Megan McKinney book that's a that's a pirate book where and it's like problematic in the extreme it feels like like check all your content warnings but the for um, all of these books for everything everybody. Yeah. yeah right um but but there's a scene i want to talk about a scene that i remember i mean i mean it's just so indelibly imprinted on me from when i was young and read this book so the book is till dawn tames the night the hero is a pirate um, but also a Marquis, because of course, of course. Um, but you know, he's forgotten that piece of himself. Um, and the heroine, and he literally is looking for like it's revenge of the. It's um no, not revenge of the nerds. That's a different book. <laughs> a very it's different book. Romancing yes. the stone, um, where there's like an emerald or something that's hidden yeah. on an island somewhere, and the heroine. The heroine's father, before he died, hid this emerald, like, on an island. And now this pirate is looking for it, and he's kidnapped this... She doesn't even know she's been kidnapped, but he's Mm -hmm. basically secretly kidnapped the heroine. And we know that he's kidnapped this heroine, and she has the final key. She has a locket that has, like, a, I don't know, a limerick in it, and that's the final key to discovering where this emerald is. And so they're sailing to the Caribbean. Again, check all of your content warnings. But, um, and then when they finally get to this, like, pirate lair, there's a scene where he's, like, it is non-consensual. Like, he is, like, going 
to rape her and she puts her finger through he is like he is just pure evil right like pure right. villain she puts her finger through the gold hoop in his ear and he's like threatening to pull it out and he pauses over her and says rip it out it won't be the first time right like yeah. and that sort of hint at his the tr- the trauma he's experienced like as a young right. man or you know in his childhood in his youth um makes her cry right like she she feels for she him she feels for him and she starts to cry and then he can't deal like he yes. like it stops it's actually a very brilliant way of stopping this scene like before it can get right from dubious consent to non-consent like and writerly wise but the but he can't deal he can't yeah. deal with how emotional how his experiences have created empathy in her or sympathy or empathy in her or both and so he like throws himself across the room storms out of the room and like disappears yeah because he can't handle it. And I think that that kind of structure, and obviously now in 2021, we don't, it doesn't look like that anymore, but those kind of, that's the kind of blueprint we're looking at in the extreme. And pirate books gave that to us in spades, right? When we yeah, were absolutely, when in the 80s and 90s. I feel like now it's just like, motorcycle club romance right i mean i feel like there's ways in which but is it because the heroines in motorcycle club romance always end up in the club yeah maybe that's maybe yeah like at the end of this book he's not a pirate anymore he's He's a marquis anymore yeah he's like sitting in the house of lords right which is its own problem but the point is jen porter who i always think says brilliant things about romance said that books like this should not be called heas they should call they should be called PEAs for problematic ever after. Mm. And I was like, yeah, there's something to that, right? Because this is not a relationship that, like, nobody's, like, hosting a barbecue after yes. a morality chain romance. Right, exactly. And so, you know, there's a way in which it's, I mean, now, sometimes they really are truly redeemed. Like, you know, I've said a million times I love Mad Rogan and the Hidden Legacy series. He, that is a morality chain for sure. Um, you know, he is completely disconnected from society and Nevada is one who like sort of gives him like a family and lets him get in touch with that. Mm -hmm. Um, but it takes books. It takes books and books before we see that happening. Um, and I think a lot of authors who are interested in this do like sort of explore, like it's almost like urban fantasy where you can like have the characters longer so that you can, like, sort of deal with them longer and give it, yeah. like, you know, I don't know, like, show that change because it is hard at the end where you're like, okay. Well, that's a really good point because one of my other picks, so Elizabeth Hoyt also does this really well in yeah. historicals. And I was thinking today how we really haven't talked a lot about Elizabeth Hoyt over the years. And yeah, and we should. That's a shame because she's incredibly talented. And so I think you can, I think there are a few of her books that, kind of edge into morality chain like if you're this if if you're a fan of that early series the prince series the serpent prince is a little morality chain but for me there really is no bigger morality chain book that she's written than scandalous oh oh we're gonna talk about two different things (laughs) i'm talking about scandalous desires which is the one about the river pirate um, so this is a Maiden Lane book. It's, I don't know, it's Maiden Lane sure. book. <laughs> it's fine. It, there's a 2000, lot of 2000, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the, but it's called Scandalous Desires. Um, the hero is, um, Mickey O'Connor, who's an Irish, uh, river pirate. He basically, he's a, he steals from boats on the Thames. Um, he runs like a community of criminals. He's kind of a like Fagany character. Um, and he is, a king. He, you know, I've said before, all romance heroes are kings, and, like, he is a real king of this kind of, like, uh, seven dials space, which is where um, Elizabeth sets the Maiden Lane series, which is uh, a kind of, like, 
imagine if Batman were a yeah. romance series. <laughs> You know, where there's yeah, yeah, there's sort of like a superhero-y element to the to this character that she's invented. And I don't want to give away too much, but it's a very fun series. Um, and it but it's all set in um a sort of seedier side of London. And she spends a lot of time, like the the heroine of this book is named uh Silence. And Silence is a widow, is a widow, and she works in a, an orphanage for which is owned by her brother Winter. Um, and she it's she's like very plain and very you know very moral. I mean, like the names themselves are all these kind of like very moral names. And um, the the setup of this book is that um, Mickey the pirate. Um, has a daughter who was surrendered to the orphanage, who he surrendered to the orphanage to keep her safe. Um, and it becomes clear that he did it because he knew silence would take care of her. Like he knew that she would, she would be safe with silence from his enemies. And then he, um, at the very beginning of the book, he's, he's stolen the baby from the orphanage to, to his lair and summoning silence, like drawing silence to him. Um, and he ruins her. He makes her kind of like walk home the next, he keeps her overnight and makes her walk home the next morning, like in kind of a walk of shame style experience and pretty much ruins like her, her for, you know, she's no longer a respectable widow who works in an orphanage. She's now like the, the mistress of the river pirate. Right. Um, and what's interesting here, I'm going to spoil the ending because I think this is really important to our point about the difference between morality chain and dark. At the end, they return Mr. and Mrs. Rivers, I think is the last name, and he's like a shipbuilder or something. And she even says, like, won't you miss your lair. Like, won't you yeah. miss being a king of the underworld? And he's like, obviously, he's like, no, of course not. You know, nothing could compare to being with you and having, you know, this life. Um, And so that piece, that sort of end piece where they end up happily ever after in society, not capital S, like rich society, but like, as people who could like join the PTA, right, is what makes the difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, right, it's like reintegration into society is like the key part, like whatever that means. Um, a later book in that series, it's called Duke of Sin. And I, it's been years since I've read it, but it's always struck me as being one of those. And in this one, I would just say if you are a Sebastian St. Vincent fan, um, the arc is, from what I remember, very similar. Um, he, Valentine Napier is the Duke of Montgomery, and he, um, I think he's like a blackmailer. I think he's done a lot of real questionable shit. And he ends up falling in love with a woman who essentially infiltrates his home to figure out if he's the one blackmailing her mother. And she's like undercover as like the housekeeper or something. But I remember, like, this is, like, one of those characters where when the author's like, this guy's going to get his own book, everybody is like, wait, how? Right? So I think playing with this um, is a, a big part of it, too. Although he's already part of the aristocracy, he's just divided from it by his own kind of amoral the life he's living. Yeah. So that's another one that's that's really good. Um that I remember from that same series. So I have a couple others that I want to mention again, PEA problematic ever after Mm -hmm. (laughs) one is the book judgment road by Christine Fian. Oh, Christine Fian. (laughs) Talk about bananas books. (laughs) Yeah. You guys, this shit is B A N A N A S like Q Gwen Stefani. Um, and it was also the first Christine Fian book I've ever read. And I was literally like, what the hell is this? And uh-huh. I love it. In this book, which is the first of a series that's still ongoing called Torpedo Inc., each one, like, getting more and more, um, 
Like, stuff I've actually never seen in a mainstream romance. And whatever the latest one is, there is, like, straight up, like, kitten play where, like, like there, you know what I mean? And I was like, I'm used to this in, like, erotica, but seeing it in what I think of as being, like, mainstream USA Today bestselling books, I was like, wow. Not in a judgment way. Like, I just was like, it really, she pushes the boundaries in a lot of places. But um, it's the first in a series called Torpedo Inc. It's kind of an MC romance, but, like, only really in the most ancillary way. A group of um, men, but some women that are, some of them are actually, um, I mean, Christine Fian has a very dark world that she's building. All grew up in, like, Russian orphanages where they were abused in every way. And now they are, like, in America, and they found this kind of group together. And they're, like, trying to, like, get vengeance on people that still do this kind of stuff to kids. And Reaper is the main character, and he is completely, like... His connection only is to this found family that he already has, but even that is so tenuous. And they hire a new bartender in this bar. Her name's Anya. And she is on the run because at her previous job in San Francisco, she, like, witnessed a murder or something. And he is completely drawn to her, but also, like, terrified that he will hurt her, right? So even though they spend all this time searching for abusers and trying to like eradicate them from the world he himself like it's all like really tied up in this like messy like these people need 800 years therapy type stuff because it's his own belief that he will harm others that he's like essentially like i can stop it in the world but i can't stop myself but he falls in love with anya and um you know it's, I don't know, you guys, it's a lot. There's a lot going on in these books, but I think it's a good example of morality chain. And I think it's a book that also shows, like, I don't know, like, broken people coming together can sometimes, like, fit together. Yep. Maybe is one way of putting it. Yes. I also think we have to give a nod to Jack Mulligan. I love Jack Mulligan. I was just going to say that. <laughs> um, the Devil of Downtown, uh, Joanna Shoup's uh, Uptown Girls book. Um, he is, the, it's the same arc. Yeah. It's that right. kind of like, he, kind of criminal ma- mastermind, a heroine who, you know, wins him over to her side. Yeah. They become partners in her goodness. Yeah. And he walks away from his criminal world. I mean, there's sort of a little promise. There's a wink at the end to like, well, maybe he'll be a bootlegger. Yeah. <laughs> but the, but right. he's certainly not going to play the same criminal games. I think I'm fascinated, though. One of the things I would say is like, I think that book does work that way. I think it hides all of Jack's misdeeds on the page. Yeah. Like, they're we alluded to, it. but they're not there. You know, and I think that that's true. I think there is a very real sense, particularly in historical. I also think, I want to talk, I know we're over time, but I want to talk about sex, too, in these books, because I feel yeah. like it's extremely difficult to do morality chain without sex. Yeah. Um, And I can't prove that, because I can't think of anything that's not super sexy and is also morality chain, but I think part of the reason why is because sex is where these men are laid bare. It's very sort of, it's kind of, it's as, it's, this is where you often see the moment where the hero, after sex, the hero is like, oh my god, nothing, nothing will ever be the same again now that I've touched her. Yeah, I mean, certainly in Heart of Obsidian, that's true. He's a virgin. Like, he's never had any interest. Size don't touch each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And it's certainly true in Judgment Road, where he is essentially really terrified of his own sexuality. Yeah, Revenge, too, has a real, like, fear of sex. Like, as a... Because he, I mean, in... (laughs) Yeah. He, he like he has a barb on his penis that like locks into her when he comes. It's a lot. <laughs> but that's fine. Thanks for telling us. Um, I like to add these little Easter eggs in for Eric. <laughs> penis barb. Yeah. Um and then the uh <laughs> um but but I think like sex becomes so so much a cornerstone to the emotional revelations for them because it is the it's the barest they are ever laid. 
I mean, har, har, har. One of the things I think that Caleb can do is essentially send, like, a stream of static out into the Cynet. And it remind me of, of McGreeve, who is really deeply disconnected from his own humanity because of, like, it, what's been done to him, right? Yeah. And yeah. at the end, like, the way that, like, they essentially come back online is she has to reach him through his body, yeah. Right? Like, there's a way in which, like, humanity is really tied to, like, a physical sense of self as opposed to, and this is why I was also going to say, I think it's really interesting that a lot of the ones I'm drawn to are telekinetic men. This is the power that they have. Because telekinesis is, like, this power that's completely divorced from your body. It's what your mind can do. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's a way in which, like, then, like, sex and touch, even maybe not sex, touch, becomes a way of, like, reconnecting you with your humanity. Being able to move shit around with your mind and cause earthquakes is cool, but, right, like, holding someone is human. And I think that that's why it's really interesting that, like, often the power, or even revenge, it's about, right, like, there's something very alienating about mind control without touch. So it makes sense to me intuitively that to bring them back in, it has to be that way. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know yes. if that's like a reach, but I think like, no, I think that's real. Yeah. Because fundamentally, this is all these are morality chain is hyper, it's the alpha on steroids, right? Like yes. it's it's double alpha, triple alpha. Like they have to be, it's <laughs> they're toxic. It's toxic masculinity. Very, you know, supremacy, patriarchy, all the like the dominant, you know, bad shit that's in the world grounded and then like unpacked and ultimately part of why we like it so much is because we like to see the unpacking we like to see the unraveling of of that this hero which is usually done in some sort of in these books in history the reason why it works so well in historicals in uh paranormals in you know we haven't talked about romantic suspense but romantic suspense mm-hmm. like the in these books is because Um, the rules are different in these books than they are in straight contemporaries. Like, you just can't... That's why in straight contemporaries, it's grumpy one, sunshine one. Because, like, Scotty... Yes. ...is morality chain... Right. ...toned down. Yeah, absolutely. Dialed down to, like, four. You know, um... Christine Fian, I haven't read that book, but like I'm gonna guess it's morality, it's morality dialed team up dialed up to 1200. Yeah, yeah oh, like yeah, there's absolutely right. So I think you know, and and so I think you know we've talked, we sort of touched in the past on this idea that like historicals and paranormals allow writers and readers to do exploration, kind of a bigger kind of exploration of your own kinks and yes. Right, pure desire than yeah. contemporary does. Um, it's, I mean, it's really fascinating because Katie, I really wanted to deliver you like contemporary yeah. romance that worked this way, but I can't find any. Well, so I do think, so I have, one, I mean, I'm sure I, there are, but I can't think of any. Well, and I think we're on the money that they're then in Mafia or Motorcycle Club. Like, they're, like, they're sort of divided out into Yeah, they're, places. like, they're merged in with those. Yes. Like, I, I was thinking about, um, I talked about, you go, Jen, and let, let me well, think about it. Well, let me say there's one that I read. I Given my initial, like, description of it, it might be that the hero pulls her more into it is dark romance. I'm not sure that this qualifies as straight-up morality chain, but it's... Ruthless Creatures by J.T. Gessinger. I'm not sure if I'm saying the name right. Um, who is a really propulsive storyteller. I don't know. Have you read this one? I haven't. Okay. Um, he, she is like a middle school art teacher. Um, she has, the beginning is that her, five years ago, her um, fiance essentially disappeared the night before their wedding. And she's just been kind of stuck in stasis. Like, not knowing what happened to him is really killing her. And um, this new uh, dangerous man moves in next door to her. And it turns out that he is 
in the mafia and has really been sent to kill her. And, you know, there's all of these ways in which um, a lot of classic morality train tropes play out which is he has been completely disconnected from anything but this society of men, of the mafia that he's part of, but her goodness, her lightness is really appealing to him. And because she has been, like, struggling with this inner darkness in her, right, her feelings of, like, am I even worth, is it worth my life? You know, I I, do I want to live without this man? And now it's five years later. And I mean, like all these inner struggles, she's drawn to that darkness in him. And again, it's a really propulsive story there. I think um, it must have just recently come out because the second one, which is about her friend, comes out later this summer. Like I said, I'm not sure it, it's not dark romance, but I think there's enough um, elements of morality chain that it works in a lot of the ways that we've described, right? Like the, him feeling completely separated, her touch being something that like brings him in. Um, you know, she's a painter. So like all the stuff about like goodness and light and what she has in her and how he both like craves it, but hates himself for wanting it. A lot of it is laid into this book and I think would probably work for Katie. Yeah. Good. Um, I know Katie's read IAD, but if you did want to go, um, Immortals After Dark, Cressley's series, but if you were looking for something that was a little bit more morality chain from the heroine perspective, I'm, I don't think this counts, but the, so if you think about Kiss of a Demon King, right? The right, Sabine, Sabine. Yeah. She's about as close to a morality chain heroine as I can think of, but her, her chain is her sister. I think. Yeah. Yes. So there's a, this is morality pet, I guess. Well, <laughs> Which I don't, I, I don't love that as a, I mean, apparently that's a thing, yeah. but I don't love it. Um, I so think, I'm, I'm, I think there should be morality chain examples that are not like love interests or that are like women characters. My problem is, is that, okay. So there's one that, um, so when I found on Twitter, Lily has mentioned a book called by Lauren Dane called goddess with a blade. I've not read this where, the morality chain the heroine has is her father is the one that's keeping her grounded, which makes sense to me kind of intuitively that that could work. Mm -hmm. But another one, and this one I'm set, I'm going to talk about it, but it is no longer available in Kindle. You can only get it as an audio book is a book called um, bullet to the heart by Leah Griffith. And she is a, she is an assassin. It had a very much had a um, like, remember that movie with, um, like little Nikita, is that what it is? La Femme Nikita. La Femme Nikita. Sorry, different thing. Um, so she was like essentially trained to be an assassin and renamed the Bullet. Like that's her like assassin name. Mm -hmm. And um, she comes into contact with a man who is searching for the assassin that killed his wife and daughter. Mm -hmm. And um, it really struck me, like, she, through her training, was essentially, like, removed from kind of society, and he's going to bring her back in. Um, and it's an amazing book. So I have not listened to it in audio, but that's now the only way it's available. So listen to the sample and see if it works. But I think that would be another example of a heroine who has that profile. Yeah, the heroin piece is hard, and it's because of... The patriarchy. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Yes, it is. Probably Kit Roca has some that are women. She, I mean, I think she's written a lot of... But Kit Roca's books don't... I don't think they go... Like, their characters are... They already like, have such good. a community. They're right. good people, generally. Right. I mean, like, yeah. they're good people in a bad world. That's not... It's not quite the same. Quite what what this yeah. is. This request is bad people in a good world, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, Kit does a different kind of thing. Yeah. Well. But again, probably circle adjacent. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think absolutely. And I haven't read Mercenary Librarian, so I don't know if that would qualify. Yeah. But I do think there are authors who are always writing in this world, right? Or, like, adjacent to this world. This is a core story question. We've talked about this before, but for those of you who haven't heard me talk about this, there's there's this concept in writing where writers are constantly writing the same 
story again and again in different ways. Um, And so we all, by the time you've written, you know, 14, 15 books, you've written enough that it's very easy to sort of pinpoint what a core story is for the writer. Um, Like in my, like the Sarah McLean core story is she rescues him right back, right? right? Like it's, that's just, I, that's what I write over and over again. And so, and it's not the same book. It's just always that again and again. Um, but the, you know, there's no question that Cressley, I mean, right from the beginning, from the, those pirate books, Captain of All Pleasures or whatever, like she has been writing Morality Chain. She's been dancing around Morality Chain for the entirety of her time. Oh, do you know what is Morality Chain? Hang on a second. Let me think. I was like, no, I mean, I know what book I want to talk about, but I need to confirm in my head. I hadn't even thought about it. But Sarah J. Moss's new book, A Court Mm. of Silver Flames, is, I believe, tweet me or tweet us or Instagram us if you think that I'm wrong. But I think it's Morality Chain with the heroine as the evil character, as the, the villain. Okay. Yeah. Um. She's she does a lot of bad shit in this series before this and has to be pulled forward. And she's pulled forward. It's tricky because she's pulled it's a it's enemies to lovers too. Mm-hmm. But she's pulled forward by the hero who is very grounded in a way yeah. that she is not. She's kind of untethered. Yeah, that's interesting. Oh, wait, I have another one too. Hang on. Let See, me look it look. up. I See, love this is what happens when I when I'm alone, I can't come up with them. And then when we're when we start talking, the list that I came to the podcast with is not the list that we talked about, by the way, but <laughs> was fine. <laughs> right. Well, here's the other thing though. I get the frustration while you're looking. I will say this. Sometimes as a cheat, like right, like what Sarah and I will do is sort of search like enemies to lovers, romance, and it just is like a way for all of us to just like, oh yeah, I forgot about that book. I forgot about that book. These this is not an easily available list anywhere. Right? This, and maybe it's because of the difference in what it's called. But if you like search for morality chain romance novels, you know what? You get a bunch of hits to our podcast. (laughs) Right? Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah, where we're Uh sort of mention things here and there. (laughs) So this is not something, I mean, there's maybe one Goodreads list and it has five or six books on it. So, you know, people aren't creating shelves called morality chain on Goodreads. And I think that's how a lot of this stuff comes about. So maybe that's something we can work on. Yeah. It's, um, this is, I don't know that this is another sort of, (sighs) I don't think there's a lot of pure morality change. So throw it out there. No. Okay. So it's Meredith Duran who I, she's never really trope. Like she doesn't do tropes the way, like her books are, are so nuanced and sort of layered that often the trope isn't, it's, it's beneath a lot of stuff, but the book that I'm thinking of, um, and again, this is um, this. Check your content warnings, but this, it's that scandalous summer by by Meredith Duran, and she, the heroine, is going through a lot of grief. She is she has an alcohol problem. Um, she is absolutely not in a place where love is a reasonable expectation for her at the beginning of this book, which is why I wouldn't necessarily call this morality chain. Cause I think like something else is happening here. Mm-hmm. Um, and he does, she's certainly not cured by love. That is not a thing. Meredith would ever, Meredith would never shorthand this, the work that Liza, the heroine of this book has to do um, as simply as, and then she right. fell in love. Right. Um, but the hero's work for her in the book and with her is so beautiful and romantic and palpable that I think this could be something that if you're interested in morality chain, but like pushing the edges of um, emotional trauma, it's nuanced and interesting. Well, I hope that was good for Katie. It's interesting for us. Thank you so much, Katie, for one, bidding on it, and two, making a donation to such an important cause. We are, Jen and I are, well, we're thrilled to be able to be a part of the Lyft auction. And um, and we hope that, yeah, we hope this helped for define a term that 
romance has spent a lot of time sort of tossing around recently. What are we doing next week? After all the Mary Balog talk, I was really interested in like structure, thinking more about structure. Mm-hmm. And so what I want to do is You Had Me at Ola by Alexis Daria. I think it is doing a lot of really fascinating stuff. I think it's a great read. I loved it. And the book two is coming out this summer. So everybody's going to want to read it to get ready for book two anyway. Right? How does that sound? I think that sounds great. I loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Um, and I just put it on a list, actually, for something. So let's talk about it. Perfect. <laughs> um, and then maybe we could get Alexis locked in for the following week to talk. We could, we've could. we been talking about having her on. So yeah. um, we can have, we could have, do, we could do both. Double duty, double trouble, Alexis. <laughs> if not, we we have a plan to have Alexis on. Um, all right. This is Faded Mates. I'm Sarah with my friend Jen. <laughs> yeah. We'll see you next week, everybody. 